Hello, everybody. Welcome to another uh, video lesson. Um, in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at comparative historical research, one of my favorite forms of methods in sociology. Okay, so what we have um, for today is a discussion of comparative historical research. And so comparative historical research is usually put under the heading of unobtrusive methods, um, along with content analysis that we're going to see in the next lesson. And so the idea of, of unobtrusive methods is that it's a method in which you are able to observe society and observe people without, without affecting people with your observations. So if you remember in some of the previous methods, one of the problems is that people will know that they're being observed and then will change their behavior because of that observation, right? This is called reactivity. And you know, that, that's a problem. You know, anytime you observe people and they know that they're being observed, then they're going to kind of alter how they're acting. Um, and so they're not going to be in some sense authentic. And so comparative historical research um, is kind of methodology that gets around this by being so-called unobtrusive, right? The, essentially, um, what it is is, you know, the people or the societies you're studying um, are either, you know, they're in the past, so they can't be affected, um, or they're, they're, you know, they're, they're such large nations, they're such large you know, nations you're using just kind of data and like government reports that they, you know, you, they can't really react uh, to being observed. They, you know, the, the nations might not even know that they're being observed. And so the, the, the one of the main um, kind of goals of, or the main, you know, strengths of comparative historical research um, along with content analysis is that it is unobtrusive. It does not, is not affected uh, by the person, the people are not affected by being observed. Okay, so what are we going to look at today? So first we're going to talk about an overview of what uh, comparative historical research is. Then I'm going to talk about two questions that are uh, important when considering comparative historical research. Then I'm going to look at two methods, two more, two kind of specific methods within the general framework of comparative historical research uh, that these sociologists use. And then lastly, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about um, the reading for today, which is my article, uh, Adapting Coercion, How Three Industrialized Nations Manufacture Vaccination Compliance, which could become particularly relevant um, uh, in the era of coronavirus. Okay, so we can jump right in. Okay, so what is comparative historical research really all about? So essentially, it is the application of sociology to history. It is where you're taking sociological theory and sociological methods and you're applying them to the past. You are, you are using um, uh, you know, these methods to really, um, you know, you're, you're using sociology to understand history, right? to understand the things that have happened in the past. Right. And in particular, you know, um, comparative historical research is interested in this question of you know, how do things develop over time? Right. So, you know, rather than just explaining how are things now, right, you know, what are things like right now, um, comparative historical uh, sociologists want to understand, well, how did they get to be where they are right now? How did things develop? Right. And so this is really the question of social structure. Right. So, you know, sociologists love to study social structure, you know, the, the structure of society, you know, inequality, um, you know, organizations, um, you know, the structure of institutions. And it can sometimes seem like that those structures are just, you know, they, 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 that's just the way the world is. That's just the way the society is. But what comparative historical research wants to do is say, well, how did the world become that way? How did social processes create the structures that we now live in? And so um, comparative historical research tends to see the world as very fluid, right? Rather than as being permanent or static, right? Comparative historical research has seen that society changes over time and is in constant movement, 
that movement might be very slow. It might be so slow that it might be imperceptible. But if you look at society over many, many years, over hundreds of years, maybe even over thousands of years, then you can see you know, the change in these structures. And so that's an important point because comparative historical research is not just interested in the past. It's not just interested in history, right? It's interested in the present. It's, it wants to know what's going on now. And what comparative historical research is saying is, well, the past explains the present, right? That by understanding history, we can understand our current or contemporary world, right? And so the central question of comparative historical research is how does the past shape the present, right? Um, so that's the second part of it. Third is, I would say that uh, comparative historical research is mostly interested in what are called macro level questions, right? So if you know macro level sociology is kind of big social structures, right? You know, the economy, religion, organizations, culture, right? And so this tends to be the material that comparative historical uh, research wants to examine, right? They want to you know, ask, they ask such questions as, you know, why did capitalism happen? Um, how do governments form, right? Why are some governments democratic and others dictatorships? You know, what ha you know, what causes revolutions? And so it tends to be these big questions, right? These big macro questions of society, again, focus on explaining social structure, right? How, how you know, how did the past create the structures that we now live in. Sometimes there can be more, you know, micro level sociology that's done historically, you know, sociology that's interested in everyday interactions, right? You know, so there's, you know, so there's questions about um, some research that's done on like manners and etiquette, you know, how did people come to control their emotions and feelings and stuff like that. But overall, it's, it's still most of comparative historical research is this big picture sociology. Right, so to summarize what it really is, is comparative historical research is the application of sociology to history, right? The use of sociological theory and sociological methods to understand the past and then to understand how the past shapes the present. Okay, let's, uh, let's delve into this question of what comparative historical research is um, a little bit more by trying to ask two questions, right? The, so it's, the first question is, well, how is comparative historical research different from history, right? So there is this whole field called history that examines the past, that looks at things that happened, you know, historically, right? And so the question is, well, what, what do we need comparative historical research for? You know, don't we have this whole thing called history? And what can comparative historical research in sociology do for us that history can't, right? How is what this method is, how is it different from just a regular history class, right? So I would say that there's um, one main difference or a couple of main differences, but yeah, two, two main differences, let's say. Uh, First is what I would say is that history is focused on mostly or mainly description, right? It wants to describe the events that happened in the past, wars, revolutions, um, you know, uh, movement of people, you know, uh, you know, other things, right? It wants to describe historical events like, you know, the, the presidential election, right? You know, this election that we've just had will be written about in many histor history books in the future, right? And so the goal of history and the goal of historians is to give a full in-depth analysis. They want a complete account of that event, right? They want to get, you know, why did this thing happen? Comparative historical research, on the other hand, within sociology, tends to be more interested in theory. Rather than just describing the past, it wants to explain it, right? give an explanation, a sociological explanation of why the past happened the way it did and how that past shapes our present. 
right? And so rather than explaining one, rather than describing one historical event, comparative historical research in sociology wants to explain many historical events. Let me give an example to kind of uh, illuminate this, right? So we see that there are many books uh, of the history of revolutions, right? We have many, many books, histories of the American Revolution, and they talk about, you know, what the what it was all about and how the war happened and, you know, how America won. Same way with the French Revolution, right? There's many in-depth analysis of the uh, of the French Revolution and, you know, Bastille and, you know, and it, there's even kind of in-depth analysis of why these revolutions happen, you know, you know, that the French government was deep into debt, um, that the elites in that country were oblivious to the pain of the everyday people, right? So it's not all description. There is some analysis there. There is some explanation, but still it's an explanation of that one single event, the French Revolution, right? And it's supposed to be, supposed to be really in-depth, like really a full deep analysis. Comparative historical research, on the other hand, doesn't want to explain one revolution. It doesn't want to describe one revolution, like the American Revolution or the French Revolution. It wants to give a theory of all revolutions, right? It wants to, you know, explain why revolutions happen from time to time in history, right? Why was there the French Revolution and the American Revolution and the Chinese Revolution? And so rather than describing one single event, it wants to understand this more general abstract concept of revolutions, right? So rather than asking, why did the French Revolution occur? Sociologists in comparative historical research want to understand why do revolutions, that more general concept, why do they occur, right? What, how can we explain the general social process? Right, so that's the first. That's the first difference. Uh, historians tend to give an in-depth analysis of singular historical events, uh, whereas comparative comparative historical research in sociology tends to explain and give a theory for the general uh, social processes that happen in the past. Okay, that's the first difference. Right. And I, I actually, the, the, actually, to go back slightly, uh, the second difference with uh, history is that historians tend to stay in the past, right? They tend to, you know, give a history of things of the past. Whereas, again, as I mentioned, um, sociologists who use comparative, comparative historical research tend to focus on the present. They don't want to just know why did the French Revolution happen in the past, but they might want to know, well, what could predict a revolution happening in the future, right? So it's not just about the past. Again, it's about the present within sociology. Okay, so that's the two differences. Explaining singular historical events versus general social processes and to relating the past to the present. I mean, that's what sociologists and comparative historical research tend to do. Okay, the second question is, well, how is comparative historical research different from other methods within sociology? So again, a big difference here is that comparative historical research tends to focus on change over time, right? It tends to see society as being more fluid, right? Not as static or firm, but rather as changing, right? And so really trying to understand society as a moving picture. So it's not like a photograph, it's more like a movie, right? And seeing it change over time, right? So time is kind of the big, Thing here. And then along with that, it's saying that, look, um, comparative historical research tends to say there are no kind of universal social laws, right? Right. It's not as if, you know, it's the way our society is now is the way it will always be, right? No, things change over time. There are no these, there's no universal laws that are good for all times and all places, but rather you have to look at to see how things are developing and how certain events affect and shape how things develop. Okay, so th those are the two big differences. You know, how is uh, comparative historical research different from history and how is it different from other methods uh, within sociology? Now, let me talk about two methods 
two more specific methods within this general framework of comparative historical research. Okay. So like historians, comparative historical researchers tend to use um, historical documents, right? They tend to use government reports, uh, newspapers from the past, you know, records, you know, to add, you know, this tends to be the data that we um, use, right? You know, kind of examining these documents as, you know, kind of seeing, uh, as allowing us to see into the past. But, you know, the question then becomes, what are we doing with them? Or right? what, what do we do with this, all this historical material? And so there are two methods which are allow comparative historical methods, uh, sociologists to you do this material. Okay, so what's the first method called? Not surprisingly, it's called the comparative method, right? And so as you may have guessed, comparative historical research is really based on comparisons, right? What that essentially means is you're gonna have a number of different cases, like for example, a number of different countries Right? And you're going to compare those countries with each other. Right? So you're going to take America and Japan and China and you know, many other different countries and you're going to say, okay, how can we explain the differences between them? How can we explain their similarities or differences? We're going to look at their histories. Right? Their different histories or their similar histories will explain why these countries are different or the same. Right? And so the essential part of comparative historical research is not surprisingly, it's comparative, right? We're going to be looking at different cases and doing, you know, looking and seeing how they're similar or different, right? So these can be different nations, right? So whole national societies, but it can also be, you know, looking at, at smaller social groups like individual states. You know, why is uh, New Hampshire different from Vermont? Um, why is New York uh, different from Pennsylvania or something like that? Right. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be um, simply comparing whole nations. It can be comparing smaller groups. Right. But whatever it is, whatever it is, it, there's still a comparison. Um, what, how do you do this comparison? Right. If it is comparative, you know, how do you do the comparison? Um, and so one way to look at it is a, is a typo typology of three different methods. Right. So what are what are the names of these three different methods within the comparative method? OK, so the first is parallel demonstration. Right. So here what you're going to do is you're going to take a number of cases, a number of different countries, a number of different social groups. And basically what you're going to try to explain is why are they similar? Right. Why are they the same? Right. And so basically you're going to have a theory about why they're similar and then more cases that you can explain with your theory you know, allow you to say how generalizable it is. Right? So let's, for example, let's talk about, let's give an example. Let's say we want to understand democracy. And right? we want to say, oh, you know, there's many democracies in the world. Um, you know, there's Canada, there's America, there's Britain, there's Australia, right? You know, why are these places democracies? What, why, what helped create a democracy? What's similar about all these countries uh, that allowed democracy to occur in them. And we might look around and examine them and say, oh, I got an idea. Um, it's the free press right? by having newspapers and you know, news media being able to criticize and shed light on the government, you know, that helped create, help, you know, help develop democracy. And so if we see a free press in all these places in the world that have democracies, then we might say, oh, there, there we can see it, right? Um, the free press is an essential element to help produce or create this idea of a democracy, right? That's us, that's parallel demonstration, right? Seeing what's similar uh, in your cases and explaining that similarity by ex seeing, finding some common element um, in them. The second is the complete opposite of this. The second is what's called a contrast of contexts, right? Here, what you're gonna do is you actually now you're gonna take countries that are completely different from one another, or there, there's some facet between the countries that, that makes them really distinct, right? Really different, right? And so what you're gonna do now is not see what's similar, you're gonna highlight that difference. Right? And you're going to try to analyze or explain that difference 
by seeing again what is what, what's distinct about them, what's, what's different between the cases. Right. So one example of this is work that's done on governments again, um, trying to explain why, why some governments in Europe tended to be more liberal and democratic and other governments in Europe tended to be more authoritarian. Right? Why did some governments become dictatorships and why did some governments become democracies in Europe? Right, we see you know democracies in the west of Europe, like um, Britain and France. But then we also see um, other countries in Europe uh, have experiences of dictatorship, right? So, for example, Poland, um, Spain, um, you know, other countries, uh, other countries in, in the eastern part, right? Uh, Russia, right? And so um, we want to say, well, what's different about these countries? What helped explain, um, you know, the differences? And there's a lot of research that's done on this, and I'm not going to go into it, but the main point is you're going to try to understand the differences between them rather than seeing how they're similar. Okay, what's, the, what's the third uh, technique of a comparative method? Third technique is what's called uh, macro-causal analysis. So here what you're going to do is you're going to use history to test the theory. And this is more of the strictly scientific deductive model, right? You're going to create a theory, you're going to develop a theory, and then you're going to use historical cases to test that theory, right? To see whether that theory holds water. Let me give you an example this, to show you what I mean. All right? So here's um, a famous book within comparative historical sociology, States and Social Revolutions. And so the sociologist, Theta scotch Polk. She wanted to, wanted to try to understand this, you know, why do revolutions sometimes occur, right? Why is it that uh, a social revolution will happen, a complete upheaval um, in a society, not just a change in government, not just like one dictator killing and executing another dictator and then taking over, but no, a complete kind of change in the structure of society, right? This is what she calls the social revolutions. Right? And so the question is, wh why, what happens? What, what makes a social revolution happen? And so Scotch Paul's basic argument is um, revolutions happen when a government enters a deep crisis. Right? She argues you can't create a revolution. You can't just want it to happen. Rather, you, um, things have to be so bad and so terrible and the government has to be in a crisis that you can in some sense push it over or topple it down. Right. And so without that crisis, you know, you can't really make a revolution happen. And so she tests this theory by looking at historical cases. So she has three positive cases, cases where uh, revolutions did occur. Right. That's the cases of France, right, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Revolution. Right? These were complete upheavals in society. But then she also has a series of negative cases. Right cases in which, um, you know, it looked like there was a revolution or, you know, people were upset and people got out into the streets, but a revolution never happened or it, it, there was no overthrow of the government. You know, things just went back to normal, right? It, it became close, but not, you know, did no change. And so what she's trying to understand is, well, what's the difference, right? What's the difference between these successful social revolutions and the non-successful ones um, that, didn't occur, right? And she's going to test her theory. She's going to say, okay, well, in France, Russia, and China, uh, the governments entered a huge crisis, a deep crisis that they could not get out of. And in these other cases, they didn't. And this is actually what she finds, right? This is her, her whole book, right? That France, Russia, and China, you know, their governments were in these deep crises, economic crises, a war in, in the case of China, right? Um, and that they couldn't, the governments couldn't find their way out. Right? And so they just basically fell into a revolution. And then the negative cases are when the, the governments weren't in a crisis. Right? And so that's how they were able to uh, maintain themselves. Right? Either way, um, the point is that, you know, using this technique, using history to test the theory. Right? So instead of taking a survey or doing some interviews, you're going to use uh, historical events from the past to test your theory. All right, so this is the comparative method. 
The second example is, uh, or second method is what's called path dependency. And so path dependency is also comparative, right? It, to be comparative in historical research, you have to, you have to be comparing some things. Um, but path dependency is more about looking at how things change incrementally over time, right? So you're, what you're gonna do is you're gonna follow society from time one to time two, time three. Let's, let's see a picture of this, right? Whoops, right? You're gonna you know, see a couple of societies and you're gonna follow them over time. Right, time one, time two, time three, time four, time five, right? You know, over, you know, let's say 10 years at each increment or 100 years, you know, right? And so what you want to know is, well, what happens? What makes two societies different? Again, you're comparing them, right? And but what you want to do with path dependencies, you want to track them over time, right? And so let's see an example, a simple one. Let's say, okay, we want to understand why one country is more nationalistic than the others. Right? Why is one country more patriotic and its citizens more about you know, loyalty and you know, a feelings of pride in their country than in another country? Right? And so the, basically the theory of past dependency is, well, there's something in the past that happened that put these two countries down different paths. Right? One country went down one path, another country went down a different path. And there must be some historical event in the past that kind of explains the two different paths, right? The metaphor here is we can think about this in terms of like uh, trains, right? That, you know, your one train's going down a path, a train track, and then you can flick a switch and you can put a, the, another train behind it down a different path, right? And that, so that historical event basically is that switch. It switches, um, you know, pushes countries down to two different paths. So for example, what would, what could put a, a country down two different paths of nationalism? So one example I got, you know, kind of invented in my head, you know, defeat or victory in war, right? Let's say that one country is victorious in war. And so its countries are prideful and they feel a sense of accomplishment and they feel like they're better than another country, right? They feel a sense of patriotism, you know, their country was that threat and they survived and they won. And so they become more patriotic over time Right, that victory puts them down a path, sends them down a path of being more nationalistic. While defeat in war sends a country down a different path, right? You know, so it makes them more humble, makes them more question whether their government was wise in, in doing this war. And, you know, maybe it was, you know, not a good decision, makes them more skeptical of the government, more skeptical of their nation and their abilities. Right? And so a defeat in, in war could make, could moderate the nationalism of a country, right? And so the idea here is that this historical event can send down a country down two different paths. Again, you know, it's this idea of no, there's no universal laws. A country can win or lose and it's not guaranteed what's gonna happen, right? You know, not, you know, some wars are very close, right? You could have won, you could have lost, right? But, you know, the idea then is it's, you know, to, it, where you end up is in some sense uh, an historical accident. Okay, that's an example. Let me kind of delve into this idea of path dependency a little bit more with this next picture. And so um, what basically the, 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 the theory of path dependency says is that in the past, there's lots of options, right? You know, there's many ways that society can do things. Right, it could be more nationalistic. It could be less nationalistic. You know, it's it's you know, there's many different options. But then what happens over time is that options narrow, right? A society settles in on a way of doing things. It says, okay, this is what we believe, right? This is what we are doing. This is our pattern of behavior. And then importantly, what happens is there's some point in which the society gets locked in, right? So this is another key part of this theory of path dependency this idea of getting locked in, that at some point the, na the options narrow so much that you basically the country has picked its path, right? That it can't reverse course and, and do something radically different anymore, right? That now its path is just the way it is uh, going into the future. Okay, so these are the two 
um, methods, right? Comparative method and path dependency. Okay, let me end up today by talking about uh, my own research. Right. Right. And so this is, um, the reading for this week is a comparative historical example, comparative historical research, um, and it's about a vaccination policy, right? It's about how different countries, namely uh, Australia, Britain, and America, how they vaccinate their uh, citizens. So a good place to start is, uh, what's the research question? You know, when thinking about an article, when reading an article, a really good place to start is to ask yourself, well, what's the question it's trying to answer, right? Yeah, and so we can ask this about my own article. Right? What's the question it's trying to answer, right? Um, so it's important to understand what it's trying to do. It's not trying to understand why some countries have high vaccination and others don't. Right? All these countries I picked, they all have high vaccination, right? They're all in like 90% or more vaccination rate. So it's not trying to understand why some countries vaccinate successfully and others don't, no. So then the question is, well, what is it trying to understand? It's trying to understand the techniques that these countries went about to get their citizens to be vaccinated. And in particular, it's trying to understand the degree of force that the government has to exercise. And we can call this coercion, right? Coercion is basically the measure of how forceful the government has to be to get the citizens to do what the government wants it to do, right? So you can have high coercion, right? So here the government, you know, penalizes you, you know, takes away your money or takes away your taxes or, you know, makes it illegal, right? You know, so, you know, government could make laws and you have to get vaccinated. The government could penalize you um, to get, uh, you know, uh, take away money, you know, if you don't get vaccinated or the government could just, you know, recommend it, right? So these are high or low, right? High is creating a law. Medium is, uh, uh, is um, taking away your money if you don't get vaccinated. And low is just giving um, a recommendation. The government says, hey, maybe you should do this. Maybe you should get vaccinated. And so my research found that some of the, of the three countries that I looked at, the three historical cases, um, Australia was the highest. It was the most forceful, the most compulsory, right? It made laws making vaccination mandatory. It had a high uh, taxation uh, penalty if you didn't get vaccinated. Uh, America was kind of in the middle, right? America, again, made laws you know, based on going to school um, and getting, you know, allowing children to you know, access public schooling. And Britain was the lowest. Um, Britain did not force its citizens to uh, get vaccinated at all, um, but it kind of just recommended or persuaded them to get vaccinated, right? And so it's kind of different levels of coercion, right? And so that's my research question. Why, right? Why do these countries have different levels of coercion? Why is Australia much more forceful in its vaccination policies than Britain? Um, so if this is comparative historical research, so how am I going to answer that question? Right, I'm going to use their histories. Right, I'm going to examine the different histories of Australia, of Britain, and America. And that history, their different histories are going to explain, I think, um, where they ended up today. Right. So what's the basic theory of the article? I'm really going to condense it down because it's, it's much more complicated than this. But it basically says that in each society, there was basically a kind of a negotiation going on, a negotiation between the government and civil society, right? There was kind of a back and forth. The government would put forward a policy and the civil society, right, would, would push back and, you know, the government would see how far it could get and, you know, the, the citizens would you know, see how much they can push back. And then, so it was kind of a negotiation that went over time, or right, over hundred, you know, hundred, hundred years, and a negotiation that continues to go on, right? Vaccination policy is what's called a wicked problem, meaning that it's a problem that will never go away, right? The government and the citizens will keep fighting about this to the end of days, right? But basically, essentially, you know, why did Australia have high coercion? 
because there was a different negotiation style. Basically, the government won, right? They were able to win this negotiation. Why does Britain have a low coercion? Here, the civil society was able to win, right? How does um, America end up, end up in the middle? Well, it was kind of a stalemate, right? The government won a bit and civil society won a bit, right? But basically the theory is that the different, for, different negotiations between these governments meant that they ended up in different places. All right, what's the method I was using in this, um, in this uh, article? Right, as it spells it out, it's uh, path dependency, right? That I examined over time, you know, one event to another, right? The different demonstrations, the different laws that were passed, right? That these different forms of negotiation put down each country down a different path. And so what I would say is, you know, there's a couple other things that can highlight why this article is a good example of, you know, comparative historical research. One, um, it's not just interested in the past, it's interested in the present, right? You know, I delved, I examined the 19th century, I looked at the early 20th century, not because I, I wanted to understand just the histories of these three countries, but I wanted to understand where they ended up today in the 21st century. And so it's really an article that uses history to understand the present. That's one of the key parts of comparative historical research. Two, it's obviously comparative. Right, it's it's you know looking at three different countries, right, three different nations, and trying to understand the differences between them. And so it's a little bit of a contrast of contexts, right? You know, understanding the differences between these two three countries by understanding the, their different histories. You know, if we can think about it in, in, in these different ways. Right? And so I think overall, um, the article is a good example of the comparative historical method, right? It's not just, lastly, it's unlike historians, it's not just describing these events of the past or, you know, fights over vaccination, but using the past uh, to explain the different places where these three countries end up. Okay, so that's essentially the it, um, lesson for today. Um, you know, gives you an overview of comparative historical research, allows you to understand how it's different from both history and other methods within sociology. And you know these two methods, the comparative method um, and the method of path dependency. Um, and that's it for today's lesson.